Buongiorno, buenos días, buon día. I think we, we are ready to start. I was just making sure that uh, everyone is taking a seat, is getting comfortable. I hope you rested well after the Italian dinner yesterday. And so we are ready to, to start this uh, second day of, uh, of the conference. I was just uh, uh, putting up uh, some practical information yesterday. Some of you told me that uh, they were not able to connect. So this is the Wi-Fi uh, network and password to ensure you are connected throughout the day. Just to recall you, to, today we are going to start with, uh, with a plenary session. And uh, so we will be able to invite on stage some speakers. And uh, the, the topic and the thematic of uh, this morning will be uh, SSC Momentus key drivers and trends. So the, uh, the idea behind the plenary is that uh, we will be able to um, get an overview about the state of the art of research and then uh, try to discuss deeper the implication for um, policy and research recommendations towards uh, after the coffee break that will, have, uh, that will take place at 10.30. One hour and a half to uh, to go to get to this overview, and uh, uh, I will not be uh, leading this session, but there will be a moderator. Uh, in this case, it will be Guy Chami um, on uh, on behalf of the International Labour Organization that will uh, welcome uh, three speakers. Uh, these three speakers will give uh, each of them uh, uh, a presentation, and then the presentation will be followed by uh, a discussion that fur will further elaborate uh, on main uh, consideration and uh, highlights. And then we will also have some time to uh, get some questions and answers and comments uh, regarding the presentation. Um, since we're going to have three rounds of uh, presentations, um, if you want to start sending some comments, I remind you that we have a, a channel on, uh, on Slido. So if you want, you can connect on this and make sure that uh, um, throughout the, the interventions that we are gathering, you can also send your comments there through the Q&A uh, channel. We are asking this because uh, if there is no time to address all the comments and questions, at least we also have a, frit a written reference to this uh, to these comments, but of course uh, there will be opportunity to also to have live uh, interaction. Okay, so I'm going to welcome on stage Guy Chami, and then I will let you introduce uh, the, the three speakers. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I will speak in Italian. Don't start laughing, please. Mi chiamo Guy Chami. E lavoro per l'organizzazione internazionale del, del lavoro. Io sono il moderatore di questa sessione. <laughs> Maintenant, je vais parler en français. Non, là. <laughs> Il fallait que je trouve quelque chose pour vous réveiller. Et donc, euh, le seul moyen que j'ai trouvé, c'est de parler plusieurs langues pour vous obliger à switcher à chaque fois. On a eu un dîner assez lourd, donc euh, je vais poursuivre en français, puis je vais enchaîner en anglais. Donc, c'est le principal moteur et des tendances dans le domaine de l'ESS. Et lorsqu'on parle de, des principaux euh, moteurs en général, le premier euh, élément qui vient à l'esprit, c'est les politiques publiques. Et euh, le, le BIT a publié un certain nombre d'études publiques sur l'ESS. Elles ont été menées principalement par euh, M. Roberto Di Meglio. Et la plupart des auteurs, je crois, de ces études-là sont même présents dans cette salle. Et donc un des éléments qui ressort de ces études-là, c'est que, en fait, la, 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 la loi est une condition nécessaire, mais pas suffisante pour le développement de l'ESS. Donc d'autres éléments sont nécessaires pour le développement et la croissance des, des structures de l'ESS. Et parfois même, le processus d'élaboration de la loi est même plus important que la loi elle-même. Euh, et donc, euh, en tant que BIT structure tripartite, on promeut en général une approche participative qui implique l'ensemble des acteurs. Donc ceci sous-entend qu'il y a d'autres éléments qui sont nécessaires justement à un écosystème favorable pour l'ESS. Et donc d'où euh, ce panel-là qui va nous permettre justement de comprendre quels sont ces différents ingrédients euh, au développement de l'ESS, ces ingrédients-là qui constituent un écosystème favorable à l'ESS. Donc nous avons trois panélistes, et maintenant je vais enchaîner en anglais, si vous le permettez. So each of them, they will have 15 minutes, actually, for a presentation. And I was told that the moderator is supposed to be the, the timekeeper. So I came with something, because Italy is a country of football, huh? 
And I love football. I used to be a defender, but you see, today I will be a referee. So I came with a yellow card in case you exceed 15 minutes. I will keep it there. I don't think I will have to use it, but just in case. I have better than a red card. <laughs> <laughs> so the first presenter is uh, Miss Julia Galera. Please go. She is senior researcher at RICSE, a research activities focused on the role of social enterprises in the European economic community, the concept of social enterprises, its legal evolution, the integration of asylum seekers and refugees. She has coordinated a number of research projects for different organizations, EU, UNDP, OECD, among others. An presentation with many focus on the relations between SSC and social enterprises, and she will also provide some key definitions. So please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Guy, for the introduction. So as Guy said, I will focus on conceptual issues with a view to try to clarify differences and overlaps between the social solidarity economy and the social enterprise. So, as we are all aware of, there is no globally agreed definition of the social and solidarity economy. So the borders of the social and solidarity economy vary depending on the country. And similarly, um, there is no internationally shared definition of the social enterprise. Rather, there is a tendency to use the terms social and solidarity economy and social enterprise interchangeably thus adding to the already existing confusion. So the social business initiative that was launched by the European Commission in 2011 with a view to creating the right ecosystems of support to drive the growth of social enterprises has contributed to a certain extent to clarity and coherence. And today I will precisely draw on some of the findings of the mapping study that was commissioned by the European Commission to Eurixe and to the MS European researchers in order to evaluate the state and development of social enterprise as defined by the Social Business Initiative in 28 EU countries and seven non-EU countries. So, based on the ILO definition, uh, the social uh, and solidarity uh, economy, as you know, uh, includes enterprises and organizations, in particular cooperatives, mutual benefit societies, associations, foundations, and social enterprises, which have the specific feature of producing goods, services, and knowledge while pursuing both economic and social aims and fostering solidarity. So the social and solidarity economy is an umbrella term that covers a very wide set of organizations including also self-help groups, producing goods and services, fair trade networks, consumer groups. So the aim is to fulfill needs of a defined category of people, not to guarantee profits to the owners. So the definition was already analyzed by Professor Carlo Brutaga yesterday, so I will skip it. But if we look at, the, at the, the definition of social enterprise that was endorsed by the European Commission, through its social business initiative, we, we will see that it is also not attached to particular legal forms, but it builds on three dimensions, that which are the entrepreneurial dimension, the social dimension, and the governance dimension. So based on this definition, in addition to showing the typical characteristics of all enterprises, namely producing goods, or services on stable basis, social enterprises must have an explicit social aim. This implies that the products and services supplied and activity run while ranging significantly across territories depending on the different needs that may arise at the local level must incorporate a social public interest connotation. In addition to this, Social enterprises must be inclusive. This implies the engagement of different categories of stakeholders having different relations with the social enterprise. Social enterprises, as already uh, highlighted by Professor Borzaga yesterday, also adopt a specific device, the non-profit distribution constraint and the asset lock, which are meant to ensure that the social aim <coughs> <Excuse me. coughs> 
which are meant to ensure that this, the social aim that is pursued by the social enterprise is safeguarded over time beyond the engagement of its funders. So as you can see from this slide, the social and solidarity economy partially overlaps with, with the social enterprise. Thank you. Sorry. So as you can see from the slide, as I said, the social and solidarity economy partially overlaps with the social enterprise. Cooperatives, mutually societies, and associations can be regarded as social enterprises as long as they pursue explicit social aims. So social enterprises can be um, pictured as a specific dynamic within, the social and within and beyond the social and solidarity economy. Indeed, if based on the mapping study we have um, just uh, almost finalized, um, most uh, of the social enterprises cover indeed the legal forms typical of the social and solidarity economy. And the social enterprises that have been set up as conventional enterprises are still very few, also in countries where this possibility is well regulated, regulated by legislation. So, in essence, the difference between social and solidarity economy organizations and social enterprises concern the aim pursued, the fields of activity undergone. <coughs> In the case of social enterprises, the aim must be explicitly social. Whereas in the case of social and solidarity economy organization, the aim can also be to promote the interest of the members, so of a specific category of stakeholders. As concerns the fields of activity, social enterprises are engaged in the supply of general interest. <coughs> Excuse me. of general interest uh, services and activities that are aimed at benefiting the community, the entire community, or fragile groups of stakeholders. And also as concerns the governance model, in the case of social enterprises, compliance with, with a partial or total non-profit distribution constraint and a set lock is a prerequisite. Wh whether in the case of social and solidarity economy organization, this can be a voluntary decision of the organization. So our mapping study has allowed to, um, to uh, <coughs> excuse, me. <coughs> excuse me, sorry. So based uh, on, on, the, on the, the mapping study, we have just, as I said, finalized the number of social, uh, okay, Sorry. <coughs> okay. This, uh, this slide summarizes the main outcomes of the mapping study. So this um, study has relied on a quite complex framework which involved diverse <coughs> <coughs> actors, including 70 researchers, and also experts in diverse fields, such as statistics, tax issues, and public procurement, and more than 750 stakeholders that have been consulted uh, in the different countries that we have mapped, and also, <coughs> <coughs> sorry. Okay, more than 750 stakeholders that have been consulted. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> that have been consulted in the in the in the in the 35 countries we have mapped, and also EU stakeholders, and it also allowed for the analysis of more than 100 concrete examples of good practices of social enterprises operating in diverse fields of general interest. 
and it has moreover contributed to 50 exploratory case studies in 11 countries. So various challenges have emerged during uh, this study, which are first and foremost connected to the difficulty of exploring an emerging phenomenon whose borders are often are often traced differently by different experts, academics, policymakers, and practitioners. <coughs> circumstances have made things rather complicated. First of all, the strong country specificity of the social enterprise phenomenon, which reflects different tradition and cultures in the different uh, countries, and also the fast changing policy framework relevant for social enterprises in the diverse countries. But overall country reports corroborate that the number of social enterprises and people employed is progressively increasing in most European countries. The demand for services supplied by social enterprises is growing, and also the environment wherein social enterprises operate is becoming more enabling. So social enterprises are more visible and recognized when compared to 2013, when the first mapping exercise was carried out by the Commission. New legal frameworks tailored for social enterprise have been introduced. <coughs> Access to public markets has become, has, has improved, and new private markets are also improving where social enterprises operate. And there's a growing support for start, start up and consolidation. There has been also an increase in harmonization of specific regulations, like, for example, the percentage of disadvantaged workers that must be integrated by work integration social enterprises. And social enterprise networks are also consolidating. So overall, we have noticed that there is a correlation between the degree of recognition of the social enterprise, its institutionalization, size, and ease of access to finance. <coughs> <coughs> However, conceptual incoherence and confusion continues to jeopardize the visibility of the social enterprise, especially in specific countries, like for instance, Central and Eastern European countries. So overall, the potential of social enterprise is still far from being fully harnessed, and there is still wide room of Im for improvement of the ecosystem wherein social enterprises operate, notably with respect to the four pillars that are highlighted in this slide, um, the four pillars, the ecosystem builds on. So the capacity to self-organize, which refers to civic engagement, and also to the capacity and to, to the inclination to set up, set up networks by the same social enterprises. Visibility and recognition, which includes political recognition, legal recognition, private recognition, for instance, through marks and labels, but also self-recognition by the same social enterprises. And also access to resources, resources which includes different types of resources, such as non-repayable resources for startup and consolidation, income generating resources, repayable resources, and then fiscal breaks and benefits. And then the fourth uh, pillar is research, education, and skills development. So legal recognition has been certainly key in supporting social enterprise development on a wider scale, and legal frameworks play, in general, a fundamental part in the ecosystem for social enterprises. However, there are very significant country variations that reflect the different legal cultures and traditions. While some countries have decided not to regulate not to introduce specific laws targeting social enterprises, for instance, the Netherlands, Germany. Other countries have decided to introduce specific laws. So legal recognition has taken place through four distinct strategies, which are the adaptation of company law, and this strategy was followed, for instance, by the United Kingdom and by Latvia. Otherwise, a second strategy is the adaptation of cooperative regulations so as to allow for the pursuit of the interest of non-members by cooperatives. Another strategy has been the introduction of specific legal statuses 
for social enterprises, allowing for different legal entities to qualify a social enterprise and conduct either a wide set of activities, for instance, in Italy, or specifically to facilitate work integration, for instance, in Finland and Lithuania. Some other countries have introduced legal statuses for social enterprise within a broader recognition of a larger phenomenon, that is the social solidarity economy. And this trend was actually followed by France, Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, Slovakia. So this slide illustrates these four different trends that have been followed by those countries that have decided to acknowledge through specific legal forms uh, the social enterprise. A growing no a number of countries is also in the process of adopting new legislation, such as, for instance, Albania, Cyprus, Czech Republic, um, and other countries. So in essence, policies and legal recognition specifically have been beneficial when three conditions have met. <coughs> First of all, social enterprises have remained a priority in the policy agenda. So the legislation has not been just a standing alone intervention, but it has been followed also by other policy initiatives. So the second, uh, let's say, uh, condition is that new strategies and legal acts provided for a general acknowledgement of the diverse organizational forms without imposing overly restrictive constraints. Because when this has been the case, the impact of the, of the new legal uh, reform has not been very uh, significant. Third, the social enterprise community has been actively engaged in the legislative and capacity building process. Noteworthy are also, uh, I forgot to mention, countries that have uh, introduce a symbolic recognition of the social economy without uh, regulating social enterprise like uh, Spain and Portugal. Okay, so this uh, slide attempts to position the different organizational forms that operate in the countries we have mapped in a three-dimensional diagram in relation to three key dimensions, so entrepreneurial, social, and inclusive. So the aim is to position each organizational form vis-a-vis -vis an ideal type represented by the social enterprise concept as defined by the social business initiative. So in the diagram, the, the ideal type coincides with the dark blue dot positioned up on the right, which illustrates the strong social entrepreneurial and inclusive orientation of the social enterprise ideal type. So, the diagram sets the borders between organizations that fulfill the EU operational definition and organizations that do not fulfill it. So organizations with the, with the light blue dot are conceived as social enterprises. And their position in the diagram results from the interplay among these three dimensions, the social dimension, the entrepreneurial dimension, and the inclusive dimension. Above a minimum value which brings us to consider them as social enterprises. So organizations with the green dot are not conceived as social enterprises. For instance, associations that do not carry out economic activities, traditional cooperatives that are exclusively aimed at promoting the interest of their members. And mission-driven, for instance, enterprises in France, or because <coughs> <coughs> that are socially oriented, but they have not institutionalized the pursuit of an explicit social aim. So they cannot be regarded based on our conceptual framework as social enterprises and are hence associated in this figure to a green dot. Sorry for the... <coughs> <coughs> Please forgive me. main findings of our study, and then I will stop. Okay, social enterprises exist in all countries we have mapped. So country reports corroborate that social enterprises are mainly community-led. 
So they often origin, originate from the social and solidarity economy and use the typical organizational forms of the social and solidarity economy. So the role and potential of the social enterprise stems from its peculiar features, namely its social and inclusive dimension. Against this background, furthering conceptual clarity is very important. And the interest uh, in and the social enterprise as a phenomenon have increased in relevance over the last decade in all European countries. However, country variations in terms of size, diffusion and policy solutions are extremely high. But independently from the degree of development of the, of the social enterprise, what emerges clearly from the transversal reading of the country reports is that the creation of a balanced and consistent ecosystem that fully valorizes the nature of the social enterprise is essential. So legal recognition is not per se sufficient. So from a financial perspective, stable flows of resources from income generating activities are, for instance, very important. Moreover, there is a need for capacity building at different levels for social enterprises and public administrations that are not, a, not prepared, they're un, unable to exploit available funds, for instance, and are not able to manage tenders. And additional gaps in skills and capacities include also public and bank, official, bank officer, for instance, that are sometimes little familiar with the nature of the social enterprise and the same social enterprises that often lack basic planning capacities that prevent them from becoming investor ready. Thank you very much. You can, you can stay, yeah? don't run away, huh? yeah, 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 we are together now for good. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Julia. It was uh, very comprehensive. You already provided actually key elements of one ecosystem, the ecosystem of social enterprises. And please don't apologize for being sick. Huh? We should apologize for forcing you actually to present while you are sick. So sorry for that. So uh, now I would like to welcome actually the next presenter, Eric Bidet. He is associate professor at Le Mans University and co-president of the Association for the Development of Data and Social Economy. He is also the, on the editorial board of RECMA, which is a journal on social economy studies. He has been doing research on social economy, social enterprises, and social economics for about 15 years. So please, Eric, you have the floor. Yes. His presentation will also focus on social enterprises, but mainly in Asia. And he will also talk about actually social and solidarity economy in France and South Korea, with also the importance of data. Merci beaucoup. Merci aux, aux organisateurs de me donner l'occasion. Thank you. Many thanks uh, to the organizers. I uh, thought I would uh, speak uh, um, French, but juste pour euh, préciser par rapport à ce que Guy a indiqué, euh, ça fait effectivement un certain temps, plutôt 25 ans que 15 ans que je sociale sur l'entreprise sociale avec deux, <coughs> deux orientations principalement euh, la france et puis un peu un élargissement sur l'europe et puis la corée et un élargissement sur l'asie euh, <coughs> alors ma présentation ce matin je vais la faire à l'ancienne la, on va dire c'est à dire sans diapositive sans support c'est un peu risqué le matin mais j'espère que ça va fonctionner <coughs> néanmoins et puis je vais essayer de développer trois points euh, <coughs> Un premier point pour comparer un petit peu les, les exemples de la France et de la Corée vis-à-vis euh, -vis de l'économie sociale, vis-à-vis -vis du développement de l'économie sociale. Un deuxième point pour euh, apporter quelques éléments euh, concernant... <coughs> Merci. Le pupitre a l'air un, un petit peu allergique, <coughs> allergénique. Un, un deuxième point pour euh, apporter quelques éléments euh, concernant, euh, en lien avec une étude couvrant plusieurs pays d'Asie et 
orienté surtout sur la question des, des partenariats. Enfin, ce, que je vais, ce que je vais présenter moi est orienté sur la question des partenariats. Et puis un troisième point pour euh, un petit peu, si, si, si j'ai le temps, et c'est Guy qui me, qui qui me l'indiquera, un troisième point pour souligner l'importance d'avoir des données euh, statistiques solides sur l'économie sociale pour euh, <coughs> permettre sa reconnaissance et puis son, son développement. Alors vous verrez que, que je parlerai d'économie sociale, d'économie sociale et solidaire, d'entreprise sociale, euh, contrairement à Julia qui a, qui a mis l'accent sur euh, des éléments qui peuvent euh, distinguer ces différents concepts. Moi, je vais considérer plutôt qu'ils représentent une, une réalité assez semblable. Euh, certes, on a des différences qu'elle a bien expliquées, on a des, des différences entre les concepts et puis surtout entre leur utilisation dans chaque contexte. Euh, mais ce qui m'intéresse plutôt, c'est de, de les considérer comme des différentes euh, variations d'une réalité qui est celle d'une forme d'entrepreneuriat différent de la forme classique fondée sur le, le, le capital essentiellement. Alors, la France et la Corée donc, sont deux exemples que j'ai choisis parce que je les, je les connais mieux. Euh, et, par, et par ailleurs, ce sont deux pays qui ont, fait, qui ont choisi de faire la promotion de l'économie sociale euh, de manière assez euh, intense, euh, les considérant l'économie sociale comme un, un outil assez, assez important de, de création d'emplois et de, de, de... Du coup, je trouve plus le mot en français, de provision, de, de provision of social services. Les trajectoires qui sont suivies par euh, cette promotion de l'économie sociale dans ces deux pays sont, sont assez différentes néanmoins. Et c'est ça qui rend intéressant, je pense, cette, euh, cette comparaison. <coughs> en France, le concept d'économie sociale, il a émergé à la fin des années 70 et il a été porté par des organisations relativement puissantes dans le paysage socio-économique, euh, assez bien installées. C'était des, des, des mutuelles, des mutuelles de santé, des mutuelles d'assurance, des coopératives financières, agricoles. De, de, de consommation. Et puis ces organisations euh, étaient dans un environnement changeant qui menaçait un petit peu leur, euh, leur position. Donc elles ont entrepris de se rapprocher et elles ont trouvé un soutien assez rapide auprès des pouvoirs publics de l'époque qui, eux, voulaient euh, effectivement promouvoir un, un mode d'entreprise un petit peu différent de, de l'entreprise classique, de l'entreprise conventionnelle avec un petit peu en, en, en toile de fond les, des modèles tels que l'autogestion. Ces deux acteurs, euh, la conjugaison des efforts entrepris par ces deux acteurs a très vite porté ses fruits en France, puisque dès le début des années 80, l'économie sociale a été soutenue par les différents gouvernements sous différentes formes, y compris euh, à un moment donné un ministère de l'économie sociale et solidaire. Et puis on a, on a abouti à la création, enfin à la, à la, au vote, à l'introduction d'une loi sur l'économie sociale en 2014, qui euh, est certainement pas parfaite, mais qui représente néanmoins un élément très important de, de reconnaissance et de clarification de l'économie sociale dans le contexte français. Jusqu'à récemment, euh, l'économie sociale, ce, qu ce qui a été souligné très souvent, c'est qu'elle a beaucoup contribué à la création d'emplois euh, en France. Mais ce qu'on voit aussi, et je voudrais m'attarder un petit peu plus sur ce point-là, euh, sans toutefois nier les, les, les vertus de l'économie sociale. Ce qu'on voit aussi, c'est que depuis deux ans, l'économie sociale commence à perdre des emplois. Hein, les dernières euh, données nous indiquent qu'on a une, une, un déclin de l'emploi dans l'économie sociale euh, sur les deux dernières années, et en particulier dans certains, servis, dans certains secteurs, hein, les, les, les services à la personne, euh, le, le sport et la culture, secteurs où interviennent majoritairement des associations, hein, qui représentent par ailleurs... 75 à 80% de l'économie sociale française. Et on voit que, enfin, ce qui est souligné, c'est que est, cette transformation, ce déclin de l'emploi dans ce secteur-là, est très lié à des modifications qui ont été apportées par les pouvoirs publics vis-à-vis -vis de certains dispositifs qui étaient mis à disposition principalement, voire essentiellement, de l'économie sociale, notamment des emplois aidés ou des possibilités de, de subventionnement qui ont été transformés, qui ont été modifiés ou qui ont disparu. On voit bien donc que l'économie sociale, même dans un pays comme la France où elle est bien développée, sans doute un, un exemple assez typique d'un développement euh, très important de l'économie sociale, elle n'est pas à l'abri de, de, de menaces et de transformations qui sont liées à des modifications de, de l'écosystème et en particulier de, du rôle des pouvoirs publics et des dispositifs publics qui sont mis en place. 
En Corée, l'économie sociale, <coughs> moi j'ai commencé à m'y intéresser à la fin des années 90, c'était mon sujet de doctorat, à vrai dire. Euh, à la fin des années 90, en Corée, quand je parlais d'économie sociale, personne ne me comprenait. Euh, le terme était complètement inconnu euh, dans le contexte coréen à cette époque-là. <coughs> Et l'idée d'économie sociale, elle est apparue beaucoup plus récemment. Elle a été portée par des, par des organisations relativement marginalisées, euh, relativement faibles, et puis qui ont trouvé un relais auprès des pouvoirs publics. Hein, ce qui a permis de, de les pérenniser pour certaines, de leur apporter des moyens dont elles avaient besoin euh, et qu'elles ont exploités, mais sans euh, encore, pour beaucoup d'entre elles, sortir d'une certaine fragilité. Mais moi, ce qui est intéressant, c'est qu'on, sur les 15-20 dernières années, on a vu euh, l'introduction d'un certain nombre de dispositifs euh, visant l'économie sociale. Alors, ce n'est pas forcément le terme qui a été utilisé, c'est pour ça qu'au début, je soulignais que j'allais euh, considérer ces termes comme des, des équivalents. On a eu au début des, des années 2000 un système de revenu minimum qui, euh, pour euh, son volet intégration, insertion par le travail, a euh, intégré, a considéré des structures d'économie sociale comme un, un acteur essentiel. On a vu en 2006-2007 euh, euh, voter une loi pour la promotion de l'entreprise sociale hein, qui a considérablement structuré le paysage en Corée autour de, de ce type d'entreprise. Et puis plus récemment, en 2012, on a, on a, on a vu une loi euh, redéfinissant un petit peu ce qu'était ce qu la coopérative dans un contexte coréen où elle était essentiellement identifiée comme une structure contrôlée par les pouvoirs publics. Cette loi de 2012 a permis d'ouvrir la voie vers un modèle de coopératif différent et de, de faire de, de, du modèle coopératif finalement un modèle potentiellement utilisable dans un certain nombre de secteurs, à l'exception de, des secteurs financiers, que la loi ne couvre pas. Aujourd'hui, l'économie sociale en Corée, elle est bien identifiée, elle est présente euh, sur l'agenda politique, elle, est, euh, elle, elle a donné lieu à des, euh, <coughs> des formations universitaires qui ont été installées dans plusieurs universités, même si ça reste encore relativement rare. <coughs> elle, euh, elle est aussi euh, clairement identifiée par les gouvernements locaux, hein, la, ville, la municipalité de Séoul en particulier, en tant que cofondateur du, du Forum mondial de l'économie sociale, on a fait un, un, un élément important de, de sa politique sociale. Donc sur une période relativement courte, on a une dynamique très forte pour la promotion de l'économie sociale, qui est supportée, contrairement à la France, donc qui, qui, à l'initiative de laquelle on trouve des acteurs relativement faibles, hein, mais qui, sont également, euh, qui se développent également grâce à des politiques publiques. Et là aussi on a euh, cette difficulté de trouver un équilibre entre euh, des politiques publiques stables, particulièrement dans un contexte où le gouvernement a tendance souvent à, à contrôler dans le contexte coréen. <coughs> un des enjeux, c'est trouver cet équilibre dans, dans ce contexte-là. <coughs> ce qui fait qu'on <coughs> voit bien l'importance euh, des dispositifs légaux, des lois, des dispositifs institutionnels plus largement, pour soutenir l'économie sociale, pour permettre son développement, pour pérenniser des initiatives qui, qui sont relativement euh, fragiles souvent au début, ou qui sont menacées plutôt dans le, dans le cas de la France peut-être, ou qui se sentent menacées. Ces dispositifs euh, sont essentiels pour permettre un changement d'échelle. Néanmoins, ce qui est intéressant dans ces deux cas, c'est de voir les trajectoires euh, différentes qui ont été suivies. Et c'est là-dessus que, que, que je voulais insister surtout. Mon deuxième point, donc, et vous avez compris que les, les trois points que j'ai choisi de développer, en fait, ils, ils, re, ils sont censés faire un lien avec les, les, les thématiques des ateliers qui vont suivre. Mon deuxième point, c'est sur les partenariats, et les, les réseaux, qui sont l'un des thèmes des ateliers de la matinée qui, qui viennent après. Euh, donc ça, ça s'appuie sur une étude qui a été réalisée, qui est en lien avec un programme dont certains d'entre vous ont sûrement entendu parler, qui est le programme XM, euh, large programme dans, de d'études de l'entreprise sociale, des modèles d'entreprise sociale, euh, portés par euh, deux universitaires belges, Marc Nissens d'une part et Jacques Defourny d'autre part. <coughs> Pour ma part, j'y ai contribué sur euh, le volet coréen et puis un petit peu plus largement sur le volet asiatique, et notamment à travers un livre qui a été publié un peu avant l'été, euh, qui était coédité par, euh, par Jacques Defourny et moi-même sur les modèles d'entreprise sociale en Asie. 
de ce livre, on pourrait dire beaucoup de choses. Moi, j'ai choisi juste de présenter aujourd'hui cette question des partenariats. C'est un livre qui couvre une dizaine de pays asiatiques, des plus développés comme le Japon, la Corée ou Taïwan, jusqu'aux moins développés comme le Cambodge, l'Inde par exemple. Ce qu'on voit, c'est qu'on a des formes de partenariats assez différentes, assez typiques qui apparaissent autour de l'entreprise sociale dans ces pays-là. Dans les pays moins développés comme les Philippines, comme l'Indonésie, comme le Vietnam ou le Cambodge, on voit que les entreprises sociales sont souvent développées en partenariat avec des, des fondations ou des ONG internationales hein, qui vont euh, leur apporter des moyens euh, pour leur émergence et pour leur développement. Ashoka, par exemple, au Cambodge, la, la fondation Thrive, Thrive au Vietnam, la fondation Schwab au Cambodge également, Ecosolidar au Cambodge, au, au Cambodge aussi, sont, sont des exemples de, de ce type de partenariat. Donc ici, on a un partenariat euh, crucial avec des, des acteurs euh, étrangers, on va dire, internationaux. Et par ailleurs, ce qu'on peut aussi également souligner, c'est que le, la distribution des produits qui sont proposés par ces entreprises sociales, pour une part importante, sont basées sur euh, des consommateurs étrangers, hein, qui sont soit des touristes, soit des, des, des partenaires, des clients étrangers, selon les cas. Dans les pays plus avancés comme le Japon, la Corée du Sud ou Taïwan, les entreprises sociales sont davantage développées, comme je viens de l'expliquer pour la Corée, en lien avec des dispositifs publics locaux hein, qui sont mis en place par les pouvoirs publics locaux, et puis en lien aussi avec les stratégies de RSE, hein, de, de Corporate Social Responsibility, de grandes entreprises. Donc on est plus dans des partenariats privés-publics et puis privés-privés qui qui engagent des entreprises sociales et puis des grandes compagnies. Et le, le, les consommateurs de, de ces entre, des produits proposés par ces entreprises sociales sont pour une part beaucoup plus importantes des consommateurs domestiques, hein, qui appartiennent à une, une classe moyenne relativement aisée qui va se tourner vers ce type de produit. Ces différents types de partenariats, euh, ils ont une implication notamment, c'est que les ressources que vont mobiliser les entreprises sociales sont, et le, le panel de ressources, ce qu'on appelle le resource mix, euh, va être différent selon les cas, hein, selon les contextes. Dans les pays moins développés, les ressources externes sont essentielles. Elles peuvent être euh, privées, j'ai plus mentionné ça tout à l'heure, mais elles peuvent aussi être publiques, hein, par le biais notamment d'agences gouvernementales de développement étrangères qui vont intervenir dans certains pays pour soutenir l'entreprise sociale. Hein, le British Council, for, par exemple, est un, est un bon exemple. Le COICA, en Corée, est un autre exemple de ce type d'intervention euh, pour la promotion de l'entreprise sociale et pour leur apporter des ressources donc, externes. J'ai encore du temps, Guy, ça va Dans les pays plus, plus avancés, on voit que ce sont essentiellement des ressources domestiques hein, et qui, euh, qui découlent de partenariats comme je l'ai dit, public-privé, privé-privé, selon les cas. Ce, cette question des ressources, elle est, elle est, elle est importante parce qu'elle elle amène notamment à poser la question de l'autonomie de ces entreprises euh, de manière assez, euh, assez variée selon, selon les contextes. On va avoir une, enfin, cette question de l'autonomie, elle est classiquement reliée à la question de, du contrôle des pouvoirs publics, mais elle ne doit pas se limiter à ça. L'autonomie, on doit la considérer aussi par rapport à une emprise du marché, euh, et de grandes compagnies sur le, le, les entreprises sociales. On, peut la, on doit la considérer par rapport, euh, dans certains cas, à une emprise de l'étranger sur les entreprises sociales, d'une influence étrangère, etc. Et puis mon troisième point, donc il ne me reste pas beaucoup de temps si j'ai bien compris, je vais essayer quand même d'en dire quelques mots. Mon troisième point, c'était pour souligner l'importance d'avoir des données statistiques solides euh, autour de l'économie sociale, sur l'économie sociale, pour... Euh, pour son développement et puis par rapport à la question de capacity building qui est le troisième thème de ce matin. Et là, je vais m'appuyer surtout sur, sur ce qui a été fait en France sur cette question-là. Cette question, elle a été euh, en fait, euh, j'arrive plus à trouver le mot français, addressed, adressée, 
prise en compte par, la, par une structure qui s'appelle l'ADES. Guy l'a indiqué au début, je suis impliqué dans cette structure récemment en tant que co-président. Euh, J'y ai participé depuis un certain temps déjà en tant que, que membre participant, on va dire. Euh, L'ADES a été créée au début des années 80 avec euh, cet objectif de faire, de faire avancer la connaissance statistique de l'économie sociale avec l'idée finalement de, que ce qu'on ne peut pas compter ne compte pas. C'est un petit peu le, la ligne directrice qui a, qu a, qu a guidé l'ADES, euh, qui dès le début a défendu l'objectif de créer un compte satellite de l'économie sociale. Euh, grâce à l'ADES, pas seulement l'ADES, mais notamment grâce à l'ADES, des progrès importants ont été faits. Euh, L'ADES a produit elle-même à une époque des données inédites sur l'économie sociale, hein, qu'on trouvait assez difficilement ou pas du tout ailleurs. Et puis aujourd'hui, euh, l'INSEE, l'Institut National de la Statistique, publie des chiffres régulièrement. Le, le Conseil national des CRES, qui réunit donc les acteurs, les représentations régionales de l'économie sociale en France, a créé un observatoire de l'économie sociale qui lui aussi produit moins régulièrement que l'INSEE, mais de manière importante aussi des chiffres sur l'économie sociale, et notamment un atlas de l'économie sociale. Et je pense que c'est important de, de souligner que pour donner une visibilité et une, une connaissance assez fine de ce qu'est l'économie sociale, il est important d'avoir des statistiques. Et cette question des statistiques, elle va amener beaucoup d'autres questions. Elle va notamment amener la question du périmètre, elle va amener la question des critères. Et là, on rejoint un petit peu ce que disait Julia au début sur les éléments qu'on qu va considérer comme fondamentaux dans ce qu'on appellera économie sociale et solidaire ici en France ou ailleurs. Donc c'est une question qui, qui englobe finalement beaucoup d'autres questions mais qu'il est important de résoudre. Quand on n'a pas de chiffres solides, il est assez difficile de dire effectivement, on peut toujours utiliser des exemples, évidemment les exemples ils ont tout leur intérêt, ça c'est certain, mais on aura besoin de chiffres à un moment donné pour appuyer cette représentation de l'économie sociale. Donc voilà, j'espère que je n'ai pas été trop long, je n'ai pas eu de carton jaune. Non, 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 pas encore, c'était sur le... À le sortir de la poche. <coughs> Donc voilà, j'espère que je n'ai pas été trop long, et puis surtout que c'était assez clair, malgré l'absence de, de support pour, euh, pour tout le monde. Merci beaucoup. Merci Eric, it was a nice overview actually of the situation of SSC in Asia, with key highlights on the need actually for data, uh, and also the importance of partnerships. So now we can welcome us, our last presenter before actually our discussion. So Mr. Samuel Barco, he is a senior researcher and consultant with at least 20 years of experience in uh, political science research and in the field of social, enterprise, social entrepreneurship development. He has done some consultancy work for the international organizations like the European Commission, the World Bank, OECD, among others, but also for governments and social economy organizations. So you have already some elements of SSC ecosystems, and I think this presentation is going to provide actually the bigger picture with key examples from Asia, Africa, Europe, and I think Latin America. So it's better like that because uh, first I'm very tired, so if I stay there and I keep on talking this way, then you're going to fall asleep and myself, I'm going to fall asleep. Uh, well, thank you, Eurixe, thank you, ILO, thank you, a lot of people that have been working in this conference and in the research that uh, basically is one of the ideas that I would like to present today. Uh, research that has been carried out in, in eight countries uh, from the all continents, Asia, all, except for Australia, sorry for that, uh, but Africa, etc., etc. Um, what I expect uh, is that at the end of this uh, intervention uh, you will have more questions than answers okay this is the first point and um, and that uh, you will be thinking that uh, ecosystem is uh, is complex is a, f a complexity but is somehow nice okay with those two Ideas in the end, I'm, ha I'm quite happy. I would like also to say, uh, there, in my, when they asked my, for my presentation, my short bio presentation, I always send a long one, which uh, has a, a very relevant sentence at the end, 
and usually they don't want that long presentation, so that sentence is you know forgotten most of the time. But that sentence says that uh, what I, I I am several sa uh, staff. I'm a researcher and a practitioner. I'm an activist, but. What I do is uh, something that allows me to have time for my family and for my friends. And uh, this is the reason, uh, one of the reasons that I'm doing this today. And quite happy because this probably is going to be the first time that my kids are going to be able to watch Daddy on television. So <laughs> uh, thank you for that too. Well, after this long introduction, I'm going to try to... Uh, See how it works? There. You remember 2015, okay, when Twitter was cool and no problem with uh, the real Donald Trump account, everything was happy? Well, we had these ecosystems, okay? This is a representation of what ecosystem looked like at the beginning. And it was only two th 2015, okay? <laughs> this is what we have now, okay? This is from a research 2018, okay? You see, if you're working with this, you say, okay, the other one. Yeah, this is much clearer, this is too much, okay? But the funny thing here is that you have plenty of stuff, all mixed up together, and you have arrows, arrows there, okay? And that is something relevant in ecosystem. Ecosystem by, you know, it's obvious. Ecosystems cannot be just building blocks put together. It had to be something else. It had to be the relationship between those blocks. And what we t start to, to call non-directly observable conditions, stuff that is there that you don't see when you look at it, but is, is important, okay? And this is another representation of ecosystem. The other one is a research representation. It's done by researchers. This too is done by, you know, people working on the field. The one here is a representation of how the Scottish ecosystem see in itself, how they, they see themselves. It's a self-awareness ecosystem representation, which is also inter interesting because self-awareness is also an important issue in ecosystems. I usually said that my father used to run a social enterprise without knowing that it was a social enterprise. And that is happening today in many places. You encounter people that they don't know they're running a social enterprise. On the other side, you encounter people that say that they're running a social enterprise and they don't, okay? And the other one, that, that is quite interesting. And because that is a representation of a very interesting policy instrument that I usually, you know, suggest to uh, ecosystems that are, you know, implementing new reform in the policy framework. That represents, is a representation of the European Commission Task Force on Social Economy and Social Enterprise. And it's done by the, social, by the European Commission itself. All those names are names of the general direction, of the directorate general of the European Commission. Okay, that is for the first whole ecosystem have been evolving from a, a more simple view to a more complex view. And as I say, that complex view, what it allows us is to say, okay, I, I, I don't have to be, I don't know, feel, um, I'm, how do you say, without power, I'm powerful in front of that situation, in front of that complexity. You have to be empowered by that complexity. Because even if you're a small actor, you can see, and remember, you can see something there. You can just, okay, I can have a, something, a potential, something to do maybe here or maybe there. Okay, so with this complexity, with this analysis, it, in fact, it empowers different actors with different capacities. Okay, that is the idea behind that. Well, seeing ecosystem as an opportunity, what it is. We have already learned a lot about different experiences. And, and here I want to tell you about two personal experiences. In Andalusia, uh, I, I come from the southern, from Andalusia, from Seville. Uh, we used to say that Andalusia was one of the big guys in social economy in the world, okay? 
I was working for that organization which represented social economy. Well, Andalusia is no longer a big guy in social economy. And one of the issues there is that this organization, CEPES, who was the umbrella organization that was able to foster social economy in the, in the region, it, it went bankrupt, okay? Because this, it was based on public support. 99% of the support was coming from public funds. The crisis hit it very hard. And what happened there? That this organization played a central role in the ecosystem. And when you take out a node on that ecosystem, there's no one else that is fulfilling many of the roles that were fulfilled by CEPES. Okay? And that was an example that we can see now that sometimes it's nice to have a unique representation, powerful organization, but we had to think resilience there. Okay? Here, this is um, another... I, I went to the States in 2017. That's what I mentioned a lot, Donald Trump, because I was landing in Washington a week after Inauguration Day. So it was a shock there and being with that. And uh, this is a representation of how many states have been implementing different type of social enterprise law in, in the states. You see uh, benefit cops, uh, LC3, SPC bills, and if you go and visit that, that website, you see how you have been having more and more of that. The idea behind this is, this is developed in a country that needed that. I don't know if that happened in any of your countries, but one of the problems behind those type of social enterprise law was that an entrepreneur in the United States could be somehow forced to, to stop being a social entrepreneur because their shareholders set, said so. Because you say, you are not pursuing the maximum uh, benefit uh, law in our country. But that, that never happened in, in my country. I don't have anyone in my country in which a shareholder says, okay, I don't want you to, to be good. I don't want you to go in that direction. So this is a, something that has been good for the state, and now it's going somewhere else. I see else the B Corporation, B Labs in other countries. We need to be aware what is behind the birth of those to, to see how we have to adapt this, those realities to our context, okay? <laughs> this is to see if you're asleep and if you're reading, reading or not, okay? Some of, the, some of you already, you got the point. No, there. Okay, and this is also basically because there are not many, too many British people in the room, okay? <laughs> so I'm happy with that. Well, what is behind that? What is behind that is that uh, is this, okay? If you go to Spain, okay, and you want to set up a, a law and a register, you cannot use the responsible person, the reasonable person uh, concept there. You cannot use it. In my country, you need a watchdog, two watchdog, and an institution that that is behind the watchdog to, to say, and, and I had to read, and I had to have proof, et cetera, et cetera, and then I give you, you know, you know whatever you, you're asking for. This is also related, if you think, I'm not talking about legislation here, okay? This is, I'm talking that this is something that is in the ecosystem. It's something that is natural for many actors in the UK to have this idea that you, it's sufficient to have this concept of reasonable person. That is why sometimes you encounter a problem when you're saying, okay, I want to implement social enterprise in one country that doesn't have this ecosystem behind. Because you're lacking, you're missing something there. If you want to implement something in my country that says it's a social enterprise, you need a register, a watchdog, etc., etc. There, you have that kind of register, the CIC, but there is quite simple the procedure. Okay. Okay, going more into the social economy at this point. When I I, I had I had the chance this year to work in, in, in many places. Okay, 
uh, and very interesting one. And I'm happy to see people here that have been working one in Tunisia and Kerin in South Africa. And they are uh, developing a new you know, framework, a new uh, set of policies, etc. And then uh, for them, it should be nice to realize that uh, when, you are, when you address an ecosystem, there are other issues that can facilitate, that can give what the so much needed oil to, you know, to take care of the problems in the ecosystem, etc. And so you, you have big examples, uh, Korea, Cape Verde, and Quebec, and I'm mentioning three different con uh, continents, in those places, social movement played a role in facilitating, in improving the results of a reform of a change. You probably all know Quebec, which is, you know, the, the, the feminist and the trade unions were key in the developing of the Quebec ecosystem back in the 90s. But Korea, you know, Korea, the, 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 the democratic movement in Korea was also at the basic of the development of the of the ecosystem and Cape Verde also the democratic movement at the beginning. Of course, Cape Verde has suffered. It's, it's not the same development that we find in, Cape, uh, in Cabo Verde, which is the right word to say, but the three of them. So you can have that point also you, to look at that potential in your ecosystem to see if that can play a role. That is from bottom up. Now we are seeing that this example, the Wellbeing Economic Alliance that is happening in, in Scotland, and there is also a network of well-being government, uh, Iceland, um, New Zealand, and Scotland, is this idea that we, the social economy, can have, a, let's say, a goal of a, a bigger ecosystem, not concentrating only in ourselves, in developing per se social economy, but how to, you know, give an answer to bigger question in economy, just to change the economy, okay? And in this, the Wellbeing Economy Alliance in Scotland, social enterprise, social economy is playing a role. Okay, not everything is nice. We were talking about this in our, in our research. I don't know, you know what unicorns are? Is this kind of new companies that you say, okay, this is so unique that it's gonna be growing fast, so I put a lot of some money in there and they're gonna go up. And yeah, investors are looking for unicorns, okay? And there is a one proposal coming from social enterprise, let's say, which says, okay, we need Zebras. Zebra is a kind of new enterprise that is based on technology or new innovation, et cetera, et cetera, but is a collaborative, horizontal, with an impact, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Well, the problem with that is not only the issue of how good it is and if I, f if I have a new specific mechanism for Severus, is that unicorns in the ecosystem are gonna get way, 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 more money than the zebras, even if we improve the mechanism for social and solidarity economy. We are in, a, in an ecosystem where the financial resources go in one direction, and now those financial resources are key in the final reserve. You can have the most wonderful zebra, but if he or he, she had to compete with a unicorn, there's no way there, okay? And the other C, we are we running out of time, how many? <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, Amazon. Amazon, according to some definition of a social enterprise, is a social enterprise. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not paying dividends. Okay, guys? No dividend at all, so no profit. And it's doing a service. You know, everybody is happy when they receive, you know, a, a box of Amazon at their place, so they don't have, you know, the mom that is working full time, a single mom is working full time, and he, she is not able to buy the, the gift for, for, for Christmas. So, we're having, we need to be more, to, to, to have a bigger picture, not only the specific 
little pieces of our of 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 those conditions, those boxes that we tick. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, then uh, gonna because uh, this is something that you should be looking at, at our research and this and the recommendation. Okay. In the research, we have several recommendations, but I'm focusing only in the ecosystem recommendation. Uh, an ecosystem can be strength if it, if it is co-designed. The participation of actors, of multiple actors in an ecosystem is per se a goal, okay? We had to move beyond legal and, and policy and finance framework. We had to think of all their impact that influence in the ecosystem. That is very basically clear. Need for better data and statistics is not only about data of number, quality, etc. There are features of ecosystem that are relevant: openness, resilience, efficiency in the ecosystem, how the flows goes through the ecosystem. When you implement a policy, does that policy finally get to the point, or there is a problem because there are too many actors in the ecosystem that are, you know, not receiving the right. Uh, the right proposal. Cultivating the international image. This is a local ecosystem embedded in a global ecosystem. So we need to be aware of the global ecosystem. We need in our small little position to realize that there is something going on that is, going, is affecting us and that we can influence. And um, finally, even the financial mechanism, financial mechanism need to be designed to cope with complexity. If you design a financial mechanism in which several actors play a, role, play a role, that is going to be a more resilient, more uh, impactful uh, financial mechanism. So it's not only looking at the final product, it's looking at the process and it's looking at the whole picture. Okay? Sorry for being too long. That's, that's it. Thanks a lot, Samuel. You say that your kids are watching, huh? So I can greet them huh? as well. <laughs> okay, I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. I wanted to check that, actually. So I'm sure that you have many questions, uh, but before, actually, you start like, you see, asking too many things, we have to listen to at least one more discussion. Uh, she's going to reflect on the different presentations. It won't be that easy. It's a challenging task. So please welcome Karen Critch. She's the chief technical advisor of an ILO project. She's based in South Africa, and she's assisting the government in the formulation of a social economy policy. Eh? And even before joining the ILO, she was already in the social and solidarity economy field. She was leading a network, I think, of social entrepreneurs. And I heard that you're also teaching now as part of the MBA on social entrepreneurship. Eh? So please. So that's no small um, task to have to summarize three presentations and contextualize it against my experience in five minutes before I get the yellow card. So um, it's a real pleasure to be here and I hope I can do those presentations justice. Thank you very, very, very much. So I think the, the quickest summary of all of this is that the circumstances are the same. And I tend to see the social and solidarity economy through the lens of South Africa, which is my home country. And let's see how far I can get before I mention the World Cup, but <laughs> so far so good. <laughs> but the, the great thing about understanding SSE through the context of emerging markets is that the environment of the emerging market means that all these characteristics are heightened. And so what we're definitely seeing is what's coming through in all three presentations is that the need for conceptual clarity is essential, but hard and almost impossible to achieve. The need for data comes through exceptionally strongly because nobody knows what it is you're talking about and what it is that you're dealing with. And the need to capacity build, not at a conceptual level, but at a practical level. How do people manage cash flows in their entities? What is it that people need to do to set up boards of governance and to manage um, the, the, the functioning of the organization? 
So when I first came into the conversation, I had this very one-dimensional view that everything in Europe and the US in, in the global north was, was fantastic and, and functioning and you had legally strong institutional environments which allowed the social and solidarity economy to thrive. But the older, I'm not sure wiser, but the older I get, the more I see that all of these ecosystems are the same in that we're operating in a space where we just don't know. And this is the great strength of policy development in the social and solidarity economy. And what we've realized in South Africa, where we are developing a policy in the social economy, is that the policy process itself can be far more important than actually some of the outcomes that we're looking to achieve. Because the policy process itself brings the legitimacy, it brings the need to commission the research, it brings the motivation for setting up the structures to develop research and data. And so the more I embark on our policy process, the more I realize that the policy process really brings all this information together and gives it meaning in a way that is important. One thing that I missed in all three of these presentations, and forgive me if it was mentioned, is the incredible importance of political will. Because your policy process goes nowhere if you don't have substantial buy-in and ongoing buy-in from your political principles. And I recently had to do for the ILO, I'm sure everybody from the ILO in this room had to do one too, recently is a risk analysis for the project. And for me that remains the biggest risk is because the politics in emerging market contexts changes and they change quickly. And when I see how some of the countries have been able to navigate political change, but keep the conversation going, I think there are enormous lessons that we, we can learn from that. So just in closing, I've written a, a few notes um, that we picked up along the way is the, also that was mentioned by all three is, is the need for networks. So for us, developing a policy was fascinating because we had nowhere to start. Where do you start in developing a social and solidarity economy when there's no network, there's no lobby group, there's no sector? So again, the lessons, from, the lessons that are available from emerging market contexts often give us the start point to say, well, we have to start somewhere we start with our small group and we literally snowball our sample group from there to grow your network. Again, one of the risks, and Julia said it really well, is the need for networks. Without networks, you don't have momentum, and without momentum, you don't, you don't, have, a, you don't have a policy process. Um, lastly, the role of trust in emerging market contexts is really important. And we should not underestimate the role of the social and solidarity economy in connecting communities back to government and government back to communities. And this came through really well in all three presentations in terms of the role of bottom up. And again, when I say that that policy process can be more important than some of the outcomes that we seek, we've consulted as of the end of this month with 760 people across South Africa that process in itself of asking people what it is that they want and asking how they navigate um, the social and solidarity economy in institutionally weak ecosystems, they do that by building trust networks. And so the question to leave you with is then our role as a policy maker or as a policy enabler is then not so much how do we build policy through compliance, it's not how do we regulate or how do we recognize social economy and social enterprises. It shifts our thinking to also how do we start using the policy ecosystem to enable trust networks on the ground. Because the institutional environment is likely to remain weak for some time. That's not going to change very quickly overnight. But our ability to figure out what is it that we can do to strengthen those ties between community actors, between people, that allows them to grow and build the social economy on the ground. That becomes a very interesting policy question for all of us. So in summary, 
All of this becomes really important through policy processes. The need for research, the need for capacity building, the need to connect, the need to talk, the need to communicate, and then ultimately the need to legitimize the social and solidarity economy. I hope I... Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. I think I would like to invite now Guy and the three speakers uh, all to join on stage. So, the, uh, no, I, no, no, we, we have enough time. To, and so we have uh, time now to, to pick up some questions from the audience or to conclude uh, the plenary session. So um, if there is anyone, we, we, we can allocate time for at least uh, three questions, okay? So I'm gonna bring the, the microphone there, and we can pick the first one here. Can you just introduce yourself and then? Thank you very much for excellent presentations. And I'm Il Chung from Unrist, and I'm in charge of SSC program there. And I have two comments on the definition of SSC and uh, the statistical issue related to SSC. Um, we have a long discussion. We have had a long discussion on the scope and definition of SSE within UN system uh, in the process to establish this uh, UN task force. And uh, somehow we were confused with the conceptual definition of SSE and statistical definition of SSE. And presenters have similar confusion, I guess. So I think it will be very important to distinguish conceptual definition from statistical definition. It leads to my second comment on a statistical issue. Uh, it is quite important to look at the global standard or global approach to statistics on SSE. And uh, in that sense, I think UN system and Euro uh, European Union system uh, have had a great impact and it's very, they are very important processes. Last year, within UN system, uh, handbook entitled um, Satellite Account on Nonprofit and Related Institutions and Volunteer Work um, was uh, published. It was based on Lester Solomon's approach in uh, Johns Hopkins team, and they have had a great emphasis on nonprofit organizations. But that handbook claims that it has a statistical definition on SSE because it deals with SE, S, uh, social economy organizations and enterprises within their own definition, conceptual definition. And it has a focus on limited contribution. So uh, a lot of cooperatives, especially those financial cooperatives, are excluded from that statistical definition. And I think we have to pay attention to this uh, statistical definition um, making in uh, uh, UN system because EU system is also adopting this approach and they are, Eurostat is trying to establish uh, SSC statistics based on this handbook concept. So I think it is quite important to, to discuss this statistical definitional process uh, in this conference and in our session uh, entitled research something, something, I will discuss about this statistical definition process within UN system and EU system. Thank you. Thank you. Is there another question that we can pick up? Otherwise, we can move uh, towards the stage. Okay. Who wants to start? No, in fact, it's not really a question that we've had, but I would I'd like to go back uh, to the comment uh, made about statistics. Uh, about two weeks ago in Brussels, uh, we focused on that, uh, and you participated in that. Uh, yeah. Uh, today, the European Commission has uh, decided uh, to uh, encourage uh, member states uh, to adopt uh, this new notion. Uh, and uh, this is what uh, France has uh, decided. Uh, and uh, the point here is that the European Commission can uh, use uh, a definition uh, um, based uh, on uh, these uh, works uh, that you... 
partir de, de ce handbook. Maintenant, l'enjeu, je pense, pour les instituts nationaux, ça va être à partir de là de construire... de proposer un paysage qui correspond effectivement à ce qu'on appelle l'économie sociale dans, dans chaque pays. Dans le cas de la France, il va falloir effectivement être attentif l'Institut national de la statistique qui s'engage dans cette démarche euh, ne limite pas sa mesure à ce que le handbook euh, entend mesurer, c'est-à-dire euh, le fonctionnement des non-profits plus certaines coopératives, euh, des coopératives sociales pour, euh, pour le dire assez, pour le résumer, euh, et qu'il inclut effectivement l'ensemble des coopératives euh, qui forment l'économie sociale et d'autres organisations éventuellement selon les, les contextes. Just a few words about our mapping exercise. So assessing the size of the social enterprise in, in the countries we have mapped has been extremely challenging. And because uh, official statistics on social enterprise are available only in a very few number of countries. So what we have done is to uh, provide researchers with a support of a statistical expert who actually helped researcher to identify to assess the size of the different uh, types of organizations that have been traced back to a social enterprise definition based on the SPI definition in each country. This has been extremely challenging because some researchers um, were more inclined to overestimate the size of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the sector and to consider social enterprises also organizations that do not really fulfill the, the SPI definition, whereas in some other countries, researchers tended to underestimate. So, uh, in essence, uh, we have noticed that there is a correlation between the degree of recognition of the social enterprise. So in those countries where social enterprises have been officially acknowledged, then it's much easier to also assess their size of the different types of our organizations, whereas in countries where the social enterprise is still at an embryonic stage of development, this is much more challenging. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try to raise some, how do you say, polemica here. So we, uh, I, I want to talk after about the political will too, so try to remind me that. Uh, I, I've been in Tunisia now uh, and assessing the, the very interesting and ambitious uh, process of developing uh, social economy there. We will have the chance, uh, if you have the chance, go and listen to Madame Nawel Jabez, who's going to talk about this process uh, later this, this morning. And they do want to uh, improve uh, statistics, okay? So, great. Great. We all want plenty of stuff. I want it to be taller and have longer hair. Okay, but the problem is that we had to deal with the conditions that we are in. And we already know that we had a problem with definition. With the problem in definition, we are going to, you know, measure how many of them we are. If we don't know who we are, on top of that. Second, I was there and they were saying, no, we want to have the satellite accounts, etc., etc. And then I told them, you know the satellite accounts in Portugal, how long did it take? They started in 2006 or seven, and the first results went 10 years later. And in capacity, in, in, in a country with, which has much more capacity in the ecosystem, because in, when you are building a satellite account, there is not only counting, saying these are 100,000 of them. You also are willing to know more about their impact. And you're asking a small cooperative that is having bigger problems to, with their life to provide you with data in, in the south of, of Tunisia? That's what you want? And on the other side, you don't have a public official that know a lot about cooperative in that area, probably, so it's not going to be helping them to do so. So we have to be aware that statistics is something that we need is if there is a responsibility in countries where we are in a better situation to provide, you know, the norm, the standards, support for that, 
but we had to have a bigger picture when we are developing this ecosystem in, in many countries, okay? And uh, in, the, in relation to political will. Political will is also built within an ecosystem. There are clear examples that when the political will fail, then the, the, the thing fail. Uh, we have in Croatia this really interesting uh, social economy strategy that was produced uh, like up until 2018 or uh, I don't know when it fin was finished. But then there is no result for that strategy because the political will behind it failed after it was built. Okay? It was built during a process in which ESF funding was coming in, Croatia was just got into the European Union, so there is a lot of incentive for that. There were a lot of political will within the government for that, etc. But now there are other priorities there. We have to understand politicians. They had to win election. They had to be elected. So we had to provide the capacity for them to have political will in the first time and maintain their political will in the second time. Because, uh, and, and that political will is also in governments, the better is to have a, let's say, a leadership within the, the government, but also many people acting at different level. You need a, the minister that should be convinced, but you need also the director general, the high official that had to provide, that had to be enthusiastic about their work and be able to, to do stuff, and we should be helping them to do their stuff and be happy when they go to work, not being sad when they go to work. Just to, and that is how we build the political will in the, in, in across the whole ecosystem. That's it. Thank you. Uh, we have time to, ad to address another question. Euh, bonjour, Philippe Chénault. Moi, je suis là pour le réseau Rêve, un réseau des villes de l'économie sociale. Et moi, je, fais partie, enfin, je faisais partie du monde des politiques, justement. Quoi. Et je partage tout à fait ce qui a été dit sur l'importance d'avoir des données statistiques. Mais par exemple, il y a un sujet qui me, qui me gêne dans les discussions actuellement, c'est que euh, sur la définition de l'économie sociale, manifestement, euh, moi, j'entends des choses diverses, en particulier sur la lucrativité. C'est-à-dire, est-ce euh, qu'effectivement, pour être de l'économie sociale et solidaire, il faut être non lucratif alors ça dépend de ce qu'on qu appelle la lucrativité, mais au moins une lucrativité limitée. De faire des bénéfices jusqu'à preuve du contraire, euh, c'est le minimum pour être un acteur de l'économie, pour pouvoir effectivement investir, pour avoir des fonds propres. Donc moi je pense qu'effectivement, euh, quand on dit l'économie sociale ne doit pas être lucrative, ça me semble euh, coupé de la vraie vie euh, des acteurs de l'économie sociale. Moi j'aimerais bien entendre nos quatre intervenants, nos quatre intervenants pardon, sur, euh, sur ce sujet, lucrativité pour l'économie sociale, lucrativité limitée, etc. Ok, we can also take these other questions and then uh, we can have final remarks from the speakers. Bonjour, je suis Mario Moniz venant du Cap Vert. Euh, je vais partager avec vous deux préoccupations. Euh, moi, ce qui me préoccupe, c'est l'autonomie et l'indépendance des organisations de l'économie sociale et solidaire. Euh, on parle des écosystèmes. Le professeur a bien expliqué qu ce que c'est un, un écosystème. Euh, c'est un mélange d'intérêts, de relations, etc., etc., euh, la manque d'autonomie et d'indépendance, peut-être, doit au assistentialisme. Quoi. Euh, sont plus les acteurs externes qui interviennent dans les affaires des organisations de l'économie sociale et solidaire. Les bailleurs de fonds, avec tous ses intérêts. Euh, L'État, bien sûr, avec tous les, ses intérêts. Euh, les politiciens d'une façon générale euh, avec ses intérêts euh, comment ils combattent tout ça comment travailler dans une perspective de rendre l'autonomie à nos organisations de l'économie sociale et solidaire parce qu'elles sentent qu'existe une relation de dépendance pas d'interdépendance euh, une autre chose, c'est la gestion, faiblesse dans la gestion. Est-ce qu'on doit maintenir les principes 
que sont, euh, sont jolies, qui sont très intéressantes, mais est-ce qu'on ne doit pas commencer à penser euh, à une autre forme de gestion Je ne sais pas, euh, peut-être euh, l'intérêt est communautaire, l'activité est au bénéfice des communautés, mais penser à une gestion privée, je ne sais pas. Ce que je vois dans mon pays, c'est ça le chemin. Moi, je sens mal comme quelqu'un qui a passé toute sa vie à travailler dans la promotion des économies sociales et solidaires. Bien sûr que euh, la professeure a dit qu'on ne on veut pas voir seulement les résultats en tant que tel. On doit voir toutes les relations, toutes les contributions que ces auteurs donnent dans le progrès, surtout dans la lutte contre la pauvreté chez nous. Merci. I'm going to give you now the floor, and then Guy, I'm going to give you the... Uh, I would like to, uh, to react uh, sur la lucrativité limitée ou pas. Il y a un document très intéressant de, qui vient d'être produit dans les comités économiques et, so et sociales européens par uh, ce qui, qui l'a fait uh, Alain Coer, peut-être qui parle de qui il serait intéressant du point de vue de la législation d'insérer <coughs> ce concept de lucrativité limitée qui est intéressant. Je trouve ça assez intéressant. Moi, je voudrais le lier au ce que dont on a parlé, le professeur Carlo Bolsaga hier, qui, qui euh, il faut produire des profits. Profits, les profits sont liés à la euh, comment dit euh, la sustainability de, de, des entreprises. Il faut les avoir. Okay? La, le problème, c'est qu'est-ce qu qu'on fait avec ces profits. Et là, du point de vue de, de, de la finance, que c'est ça qu'on a étudié dans notre, report, euh, no, notre étude, <coughs> là, c'est important le sujet ownership right. La, 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 et la asset lock. On voit que pour nos, nos entreprises, comme on a cet asset lock, ce n'est pas comme on dit, on ne donne pas de dividendes, on, on, on a si, un total asset lock, comme on disait hier M. Borsaga, c'est que si à la fin tu veux, tu, tu veux vendre ton entreprise, tout cet argent n'est pas pour toi qui est le propriétaire, c'est pour faire une autre entreprise comme la tienne. Okay? C'est pour définir plus ou moins. Okay? Donc, ça, c'est le problème pour la finance telle qu'on l'a maintenant. Parce que pour euh, le capital, pour investir, le mec qui investit dans Amazon maintenant, qui ne va pas avoir des dividendes pendant beaucoup de temps, il le fait parce qu'il sait que dans 10 ans, les millions qu'il a investis, il peut les retirer en 10 millions. Nous, on a un problème avec ça. Donc, nous, on n'est pas préparé pour ce concept de lucrativité, mais surtout sur les, par les concepts que la finance tient des asset lock et des et de lucrativité extrêmes. C'est le problème que nous avons. C'est pour ça que les cas qu'on a étudiés, les divers cas dans lesquels nous montrons avec une finance différente qu'il y a une possibilité de soutenir des entreprises, mais donc, la finance joue un rôle secondaire parce qu'il n'a pas de ownership right, n'a pas de droit de propriété sur là, et il pas, pas, il, eux, les investisseurs, ne peuvent pas attendre d'avoir une, euh, une production de dix fois ce qu'ils ont fait. C'est là où le jeu est joué <coughs> maintenant, parce que, je vous rappelle, 80% des mouvements internationaux, ce sont seulement spéculatifs. La finance va dans un autre sens. Et si moi, je vais promouvoir des bras, euh, je dois louer, lutter contre 80% des flous qui sont là. Vous voyez uh, I will try to answer the, the question addressed by the person from... Uh, Okay. Uh, the question, the issue of autonomy. So, uh, in Europe, um, the integration of social enterprises in the welfare system has certainly allowed for a, a stable uh, flow of, of resources and for 
the uh, consolidation of social enterprises, but at the same time, it has also led to a progressive uh, weakening of the capacity of social enterprises to identify needs because they have started to address the needs defined and decided by public, uh, public authorities. So I think one strategy, so those social enterprises that are more independent from the policy lines defined by policymakers are those that have kept a very strong local anchorage. So those that are rooted in local communities, those social enterprises continue to address and to, to capture new needs that may arise in, uh, in society. And so I, I think uh, it, this is very important to keep this local anchorage, to, to, uh, to remain rooted in local communities. And therefore it's very important to look at participation and at the governance who are the stakeholders of social enterprises. And at the same time, uh, I think the management tools that should be uh, adopted by social enterprises should reflect this uh, added value and this competitive advantage in addressing needs in, in local communities. So management tools and strategies should not mimic uh, those that are adopted by traditional enterprises, but should be consistent with, with the nature and with, with the values of, uh, of, uh, of these types of organizations. Alors mes, deux, <coughs> mes deux collègues ont largement euh, répondu. Je ne vais pas dire grand-chose juste sur la question de la non-lucrativité. C'est vrai qu'en tant qu'organisation économique, une organisation d'économie sociale, elle a la nécessité d'être euh, <coughs> profitable, en quelque sorte, hein, d'assurer sa pérennité par un, un modèle qui, qui soit soutenable. Euh, la question, effectivement, c'est celle de, des règles qui sont, enfin, des dispositions réglementaires qui sont euh, adoptées en matière de possibilité de distribuer ce profit euh, en direction des, des investisseurs qui sont des sociétaires, en l'occurrence, et puis de distribuer le, le capital, la dispersion du capital euh, en cas de, de, de ces sessions d'activité, hein, où là, effectivement, y a, on retrouve des, des réglementations, des mesures réglementaires très strict sur euh, ce qu'elle peut faire euh, en la matière. Mais il y a un enjeu là-dessus, euh, c'est vrai, euh, <coughs> essentiel, euh, notamment parce que euh, ce qu'on voit euh, émerger aussi, c'est une, une notion de la non-lucrativité portée par, euh, par la Commission européenne qui euh, fait reposer cette idée de non-lucrativité sur le bénévolat. Euh, et, <coughs> et les organisations d'économie sociale, si le bénévolat est une de leurs ressources importantes, euh, ne sont pas pour autant des organisations qui sont euh, uniquement bénévoles. Et ça, c'est une vision qui, euh, qui a tendance à, à, à progresser et qui, qui constitue un enjeu, je pense. Sur la question conceptuelle, c'est vrai qu'on a besoin de clarification conceptuelle, mais en même temps, euh, on ne pourra pas, euh, je pense, euh, proposer une définition universelle, que ce soit de l'économie sociale, de l'entreprise sociale. Donc on peut clarifier euh, un cadre, mais ce qui est intéressant, je pense, c'est de voir dans quelle mesure ce cadre euh, s'applique différemment dans différents contextes. Il euh, y, y, <coughs> y a une notion que je trouve assez, euh, assez porteuse, moi, sur cette question-là, c'est ce que Desroches appelait les interfaces euh, dans ses travaux. Euh, il expliquait qu'on avait euh, un secteur de l'économie sociale avec des acteurs euh, bien identifiés, et puis on avait un certain nombre d'interfaces avec d'autres secteurs de l'économie, et que... On, bah, à ces interfaces, on trouve des organisations qui s'éloignent du centre, donc qui se rapprochent des marges, mais qui sont porteuses peut-être d'évolution à venir, euh, de modification de, du périmètre. Hein, et c'est dans les exemples que j'ai utilisés, la France et la Corée, on voit bien finalement qu'on est dans, des, dans deux cas où on, on voit une convergence des concepts d'entreprise sociale et d'économie sociale, hein, qui finissent par... Euh, <coughs> L'économie sociale finit par englober dans les deux cas... Euh, l'entreprise sociale on pourrait dire mais en France euh, les trajectoires sont inverses en fait en France on part de l'économie sociale et puis avec la loi 2014 on propose des, des, <coughs> des éléments qui vont permettre d'ouvrir le périmètre un peu traditionnel à des acteurs qui sont ceux de l'entreprise sociale alors qu'en Corée on, on a une reconnaissance d'abord de l'entreprise sociale et puis on voit émerger une tendance à utiliser un concept d'économie sociale qui va englober notamment l'entreprise sociale et d'autres choses 
Just to conclude, just to say that actually, as you can see, eh, the issue of ecosystem is very complex, but also very critical. But the idea of this, I think, session was not to conclude on everything, but just to start a discussion that we should be able to continue in the parallel sessions. So I think we should congratulate our panelists because having that first session this morning, actually, after the long and heavy dinner we had last night, <coughs> was not an easy one. So I think we should just I think, give them a round of applause. That's it.